So I will start a five minutes introduction and then or we can continue from then on. So hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Um, my name is Wai Wai and welcome to today's lecture, The Smartless Mundane, Neoliberalism, Neo-Led and Reactionary Politics. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Orit Happen as the speaker at the Far Art Lecture Series. As you probably guess, I'm so excited and I'm so excited to have Orit with us today. Professor Orit Happen is the Lighthouse Professor and Chair of Digital Captures and Societal Change at Dresden University of Technology. She's also the author of the much acclaimed title, Beautiful Data, A History of Vision and Reason by the Duke University Press. And she also has an upcoming book with the MIT Press, um, The Smartless Mundane. As a historian of science, old work bridges the history of science, competing in cybernetics with design. She's currently working on two projects. The first is a history of automation, intelligence, freedom. The second project examines extreme infrastructure and history of experimental experimentation at planetary scale in design, science and engineering. I truly believe that Aura's unique body of research is very relevant and important in current discussion on new forms of intelligence, new scale infrastructure, and the reimagination of the future. But before I can give you Aurid, I'm afraid I have to do four points of general information and housekeeping reminder. First, this lecture is hosted by Fan Art, and Fan Art is an international doctoral program hosted by University of Wolverhampton, University of Edinburgh, Zeppelin University, and the University of Iceland. And it is generously supported by the European Commission and the Marine Cure Grant. And second, for the quick schedule today, or we're going to speak 45 minutes and then we hopefully have 30 minutes to 45 minutes for Q&A where you can interact with or with and ask for questions. And third, as Kai mentioned, this lecture will be recorded and will be shared and published for educational purpose. And last but not least, as you know, some of you know that this is the first time we use Teams for hosting this lecture. So we may encounter technical difficulty or hang up, but I can reassure you, we are in the very safe hands of Zeppelin University. And thank you so much for Kahan and Philip and Marie Sylvie for the support. And now I want to give a very, very warm welcome to Professor Orit Happen. Thank you so much, uh, Weiwei, and also Karen, and all the people who invited me. It's, it's an honor to be here. And this is a really exciting initiative uh, in graduate education that you have. Um, so I'm, I've been honored to be asked to present. Um, so I, I'm not an art historian, but um, I hope that this will have interesting questions that will speak to the discipline and to the issues you're thinking about in terms of media studies and media theory. Um, and actually today's presentation is not even really the material is not particularly visual, but I think that's something we can discuss. What does it what does it mean to think about uh, the desire to evade representation uh, in building artificial intelligence and machine learning? Um, how does that resonate with older histories of democracy and politics as well as media. So without further ado, um, I titled this The Smartness Mandate. Uh, I will be, it, it will be talking about neoliberalism, neural nets and reactionary politics. Uh, it's part of um, a book that I am currently is about to come out in late December and I guess in Europe in early January with uh, Robert Mitchell from MIT Press titled The Smartness Mandate. It's a little bit of a preview of that. Um, and then, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to move this uh, slideshow. Um, so for people who know me or know my work, you know that I've worked a lot in the past on things like smart cities, like this one in Songdo, Korea, smart ports. I tend to study really big things, big ubiquitous computing infrastructures, smart mines. This is a mine in um, Northwest uh, Quebec, Canada that I've spent a lot of time. Um, and while these may not be 
seemingly likely places to be thinking about computing. Of course, many of these installations, particularly extraction industries, are some of the most heavily um, automated and computationally driven industries on Earth. Um, so uh, these, these are the kind of sites where I try to seek to understand how digital infrastructures and digital computers are transforming human life and habitat uh, globally. And of late, I've been thinking a lot about um, planetary scale experiments. Um, so places like this in Chile, we have also visited, which is the European Space Observatory's Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. It was part of the Event Horizon Telescope. So I've been thinking about what it means to turn the whole Earth, for example, into a disk for the reception of signals from far out in space. Uh, so what, you know, how do we think about that historically, epistemically? Um, what sort of society makes the planet into media? But for the purpose of this talk, one of the other infrastructures I've been looking at has been that of economics and finance. And these are images from the Canadian Center for Architecture's archive of asymptote. They're, uh, uh, they were early leaders in kind of digital methods for architectural rendering. And they were hired by the New York Stock Exchange to create, if you will, the future representation of the market uh, in this kind of visual, this, uh, I'm trying to move this. Um, this is kind of uh, this image of this virtual stock exchange that they produced. And the interesting thing here is about the market as um, this space for information and transaction. And in fact, at the end, this whole installation was, and they had all these imagined images of the New York Stock Exchange. By the time this project was executed, of course, uh, it was obsolete because all of markets had actually gone digital and were uh, in algorithmic trading and digital technologies, of course, are the, are the kind of underpinning infrastructures for finance. And um, we didn't need these representations and really it was just used as a stage set for CNN uh, and other new shows covering Wall Street. These things pose certain questions, of course, for historians of architecture and design, mainly about what are these interfaces for, right? What forms of interactivity are being developed here? What types of perception and cognition? These interfaces, more than anything, aren't so much about showing us what's the reality of the market, but rather training us to be participants in the market, making markets into interactive interfaces that um, might be ubiquitously accessible. And today we might think of Robin Hood or any of the other kind of apps that we're constantly using to trade. Uh, and of course, this kind of, the question then begs like, what's the relationship between this aesthetics and its interfaces and of course, finance capital. And of course, these kind of images are happening at the moment that here you can see uh, the growth in the United States of financial assets as part of the GDP. And you see that that light blue thing has now grown to the fact that financial assets are 400 times the size of the gross domestic product of the United States by the early 2000s, and it's only grown. This is an image of the size of the markets from 2022. And you can see that the entire world's gross domestic product is 50 trillion and global financial derivatives market is $700 trillion. So we have a massive, massive transformation here in wealth and how we organize society that um, dwarfs basically older measures of labor and productivity. And it comes with a new kind of territory of, uh, of finance which is largely, as you can see, there's nothing in Africa or Latin, or not very much in Latin America, but these are the largest exchanges in the world and pretty soon Asia will be larger than the Americas, um, probably within the next five years. So you're seeing kind of these dramatic kind of geographies emerging around this, along with of course, transformations in how wealth and capital are organized. Uh, this is just an example from 2020. Interestingly enough, um, now Aramco is back in the largest, but what you see is largely that 
smaller group of corporate actors own more of the wealth and increasingly now we have other uh, private entities and so forth. And this might be a well-known story to all of you, but we often think about how form follows finance, at least in architecture and design. So we might ask about how these new financial territories are executing themselves, both in terms of our built habitat and in terms, of course, of our art. Uh, so this is just um, Takeshi Murakami. I'm not, a, like I said, I'm not an expert, but is well known for kind of cross, toyfully crossing the line with, uh, in this case, NFTs and also with commercial marketing. Um, we have Pax Emerge uh, piece selling for 91 million US dollars. But also one of the other things that I'm gonna interrogate in the course of this talk, coming to the most uh, recent documenta, is the idea and the rise of the self-organizing system, the collective as kind of a, um, a matter of interest. And, and we're gonna ask, and as a kind of form that uh, is increasingly valorized in our present. So today's talk is actually mostly going to talk about finance, but it's also going to be related to collectives, both those of the alt-right and perhaps otherwise. And one of our questions will be, how, how might we um, engage between these relations between technology, economy, and collectivity? So um, without further ado, that's a fairly complicated thing, but this talk is gonna outline my genealogy of the self-organizing system and the networked intelligence as the dominant or kind of hegemonic forms, at least uh, in the US, um, both aesthetically, but also um, in terms of imagining uh, social forms and economic ones with subsequent concerns about increased disparity and the political implications. So I'm gonna start the talk now with um, a famous quote from Friedrich Haig. So in 1945, the economist Friedrich Haig began his battle on behalf of neoliberalism with a call to rethink knowledge in an essay that looms large over the history of contemporary conservative and libertarian thought, Haig inaugurated a new concept of the market. And this is a concept that I'm going to lay out today in thinking about what the relationship between AI, reactionary politics, and contemporary finance and political economy are. The peculiar character of the problem of the rational economic order is a knowledge that never exists, he said. The economic problem of society is a problem set out by data, is a problem of the utilization of knowledge not given to anyone in its totality. This was no small claim. When situated within the broader context of Hayek's engagements with the sciences and technologies of his time, this seemingly theoretical statement gestures to a grand aspiration, a fervent dream of a new world governed by data. At the heart of Hayek's conception of a market was the idea that no single subject, mind, or central authority has complete knowledge of the world. Such proposals might seem at first as unintuitive responses to political catastrophe. Haig was a fierce critic of both fascism and communism. His argument concerning the uses of knowledge was in direct response to what he viewed as a violent political crisis created by democratic populism. His response, unlike that of many other uh, cultural critics of the time, was not, however, to buffer the support for a reasonable liberal human subject, but rather to imagine the replacement of human reason through distributed intelligence and the technology of the market. This emerging neoliberal imaginary did not operate in isolation. As historians of science have noted, Cold War rationality did not conform to the dictates of enlightenment reason. The specter of technologically induced planetary destruction through nuclear war and the memory of global war predated a critique of human decision-making. This critique fostered the production of formal, repeatable, and algorithmic model of decision-making, one that perhaps mirrored the emerging new computer technologies of the time. And you embodied in sites such as RAND, where you're seeing these gentlemen working. So kind of belief that we had to create a technocratic 
gain theoretical algorithmic form of decision making to replace the arbitrary and affective um, problematic kind of for a uh, human decision making, or shall we say, um, not properly trained human decision making. But if the rational decision maker, as shown here, was still an expert in area studies or science, the intelligent Hayek, I propose, argue was somewhat different. For Hayek, um, for Hayek, the rational technocrat was still capable of objectivity, planning, and predicting the future. But the figure that Hayek is projecting is not. This is a subjective and ignorant figure that we're provided with through the work of this economist. Almost simultaneously, and in conversation with economists, psychologists, and technologists, other people were also proposing similar models of the mind at exactly the same time, or the brain. Hayek's work was informed by Donald Hebb's work on neural networks, which was also linked to the shock doctrine um, in Naomi Klein's work. And this kind of this work was seen as foundational for the development of neural net technology, which I'll talk about later. And then this sort of research informed the work of computer scientists and psychologists like Frank Rosenblatt, who we see here actually building the first operational neural networks. I will discuss these links and ask questions about the structures of these actual relations and how they impact our contemporary environments. So to start, I'm going to talk about how we became neural. In 1948, Donald Olding Hebb published The Organization of Behavior, one of the most famous books ever in psychology. It's been paralleled in the field to Darwin's Origin of the Species. The book presented a new concept at the time of neuroplasticity. It was a connectionist account that argued basically that neurons that wire together fire together, and that what is stored in brain, the content of perceptions or cognitive activities, is not the result of an infinite database. So there's no like Freudian unconscious, but rather that certain stimuli trigger networked pathways that collaboratively create an action or thought or behavior. The more they're triggered together, the more they learn. So, it, so basically, for example, um, here's a glass with some Diet Coke. Uh, in my brain, I do not remember every picture of a glass that I've ever seen. Rather, every time I see something like this, getting this into the uh, thing, um, a certain pattern of neurons fires. And so therefore, uh, the more they fire together, the more I recognize glass. So if this sounds familiar, it's because it resembles machine learning with populations of data. And this was a kind of model, and he was working with people who had been injured during the war, and he was really interested in how the brain rewired to compensate for the loss of certain capacities. So if you're blinded, you'd compensate perhaps with uh, certain hearing. Uh, if people lost a limb, they'd start compensating with their main. And that his idea was that your brain is basically plastic. It's made up of these nets that get triggered according to certain stimuli, but it also meant that those nets could be reprogrammed. In his now famous sensory deprivation study, um, is illustrative of this new neuroplastic or reprogrammable world. While this research has gained infamy as the progenitor of soft torture in the CIA, its initial goal was far more banal. It was to examine the monotony of contemporary work environments and their impact on attention. So radar operators and other people working in the newly electronic workspace were known to suffer extreme boredom in attention and depression. Uh, to test the monotony of the modern work environment, 22 male students were put in this, um, in this situation, were recruited to lie in a chamber designed to induce perceptual isolation. You can see that here. Um, the experimental theory correlated, therefore, the increase of, inter of electronic data with sensory deprivation, which is interesting. That too much data might be like no data at all uh, for your sensory system. I might extrapolate that implicitly boredom and information overload were assumed to be related, which is to say too much data given in certain environments might be the same as no data at all. To ensure maximum boredom, the students were put in scenarios like the one you're seeing, um, and they were supposedly their eyes were covered, everything was muffled, um, 
they they couldn't like their 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 hands were kind of bound up um so supposedly you were you had low sensory um deprivation and there was sensory deprivation and they occasionally then and these were psychology students uh streamed kind of um subliminal messages like about ghosts or the supernatural um many people actually by the end seemed to in, believe in these kind of messages that there was ghosts and the supernatural and no one lasted more than four days uh, the study appeared to demonstrate a way to impact people's thinking without ever touching their bodies so uh this is a these are images um from an article that was that was done on this study in the 50s uh, and people saw images like or described that they saw images like this men in bathtubs spaceships squirrels uh it's canada so you know this is what people fantasize about um and when and so basically people really seem to and they all seem to really um essentially go crazy under these conditions. When adjoined to theories of network cognition and neuroplasticity, it appeared that brains could be remotely programmed. You could input um, hallucinations, you could convince people to believe in things that uh, as, as kind of male scientists in the 50s, they shouldn't be believing in like ghosts. Um, and that you could do this from afar through suggestion and environmental manipulation of data. Hebb himself labeled this torture, an observation that found concrete realization in the CIA's Cold War interrogation. So he abandoned this line of research, but it was taken up by uh, the CIA and other researchers um, further. And as the funding sources and reasons for the studies demonstrated, heavy notions of network cognition were also a new way to know the world and a new epistemology for the information economy. These studies originated to understand what the new excesses of data and homogeneity of electronic media might do to the mind, while also creating a new understanding of cognition as scalable, enhan enhanceable, and programmable. So this is kind of an environmental cognition that uh, people are, this kind of model is developing. After the study, debates have raged over whether participants uh, suffered from too little data or too much. The sounds, for example, uh, there was apparently a fan going um, and there was temperature changes. Uh, the sounds and stimulus of the containment are also pot potentially forms of stimulus. For psychologists, an army of trainer after head, information overload increasingly became a norm and an expectation. When, so what's really interesting is uh, within a decade after these studies, what had been seen as torture and pathology increasingly became the site of um, of training uh, and even meditation. So John Lilly started working on flotation tanks, and today we have a number of these methods or training uh, training regimes, if you will, for the shocks of contemporary life, aimed at teaching the subject to concentrate and manage and filter excess data, now labeled stress. So immersion tanks, but we can also think of yoga, self-care, apps for sleep, concentration, and mindfulness, all of which supposedly arose from this research. So essentially what had been a problem, information overload or, or shock, because that, you know, Chalk doctrine has now become a normalized thing that subjects are supposed to manage uh, through a whole series of new techniques and technologies. What had been torture was increasingly understood as the very condition of contemporary electronically mediated life and learning to manage that pain became an essence of survival, preferably through conditioning attention and the senses through these different modes. Which brings us to neural markets. For cyberneticians, psychologists, and soon economists, the idea of an ecologically networked cognition could be a way to reconceive how trauma was dealt with, whether at individual levels or at the level of economy. For Hayek, the model of the market was also a model of cognition and mind, culminating in his 1952 introduction of the sensory order, um, where he basically thanks uh, Donald Hebb for inspiring him for thinking about how psychology and agency might be linked to his market theories. In this particular account, Hayek posited the mind, 
that was linked relationally and to the environment. So he said, what we call mind is this a particular order of a set of events taking place in some organism and in some manner related to, but not identical with the physical order of events in the environment. Which is to say, for Hayek, the world is not comprised of things that are clearly out there in the world. There's not a one-to-one -one relationship between what we, our cognition and our perception and our mind and what's happening outside in the world, but rather there's a set of processes that intervene. And of course, there's a whole history of people who think this, so Hayek's not alone. But what's important is that it's very important to him to instate on the idea that the mind is always subjective, that human beings are subjective and can't make fully objective decisions. There's kind of a separation between mind and the, what separates is a relation of processes, that there's a set of events, as he puts it. He goes on to say that this, these are physiological processes that manifest in a temporal order. The phenomena, he said, that we are interested in is mainly under the heading of discrimination. And this term is misleading because it suggests a sort of recognition of physical differences between the events which it discriminates, but we're concerned for him, economists need to be concerned with a process that creates the distinctions in question. So for him, he is not interested in a world of ontologically fixed entities, right? There's no uh, objects in the world that are just there. There's rather processes that create distinctions. Uh, and we'll come back to this question. And the same is true. So the process of cognition is about sorting out, differentiating, um, classify, but without the fact that there's like a known world out there that can just be discovered. When situated within a history of both statistical thought and neural nets, the statement takes input. For Hayek, the world is not comprised of clearly discriminating things or of recognizable entities. Rather, it's a world of processing whose goal is to produce discrimination and recognition um, or distinctions. And we can think about discussions of difference and discrimination in network intelligence systems here. And I'll come back to this question about difference as a site of value. Um, the world therefore is not full of pre-existing already known objects or subjects to recognize, but also to discriminate is a process for human beings. One that Hagen says cannot be known by one subject. And being a process, perception also unfolds in time. This temporality lent mind a self-organizing property that denoted that human cognition could not be reduced to its material basis. So there's this separation, right, between um, what happens. There needs to be these networks to create more than the sum of their parts. Minds like markets could never be fully calculated, therefore, since we're all subjective, even as their physical and environmental conditioning makes individual cognition subjective and limited. By deduction, we might also understand, and he, later he would elaborate on this, the brain, and perhaps by extension the state, as having largely the function as a repository or archive of these apparatuses of classification or models of construction. States does only serve the function of being an archival repository of processes. So states have solely the, the necessity of being like, just like your brain, a storage of nets that fire together a kind of series of patterns that they store that can be the building blocks for markets, but that is all a state does. It's supposed to be the repository for the material that will make, will bring together a market. Um, otherwise states are not supposed to, so it's markets that would make decisions, not governments. Um, and this is a critical feature of, of a kind of Hayek's ideology, right? It's just, you cannot plan, you cannot know, everything is subjective and relational. This is an idea that Hayek forwarded. We discover that uh, many institutions and human achievements rest are functioning without a designing or directing mind. In this account, human institutions are not designed. They emerge as a result of accumulating processes over time, from this perspective, the Hebbian inspired physiological account of learning as a process of forging neurological connections explains why individuals have to be bound together through the population level institution of the markets. While Hayek initially deferred from um, actually directly making corollaries between analogies between minds and markets by 1977, he presented 
a, a quite different account. He was quite explicit about it, that each member, neuron or buyer or seller um, isn't even conscious. And the price in the market system is in that sense, a system of communication. So increasingly, he's very clear about it that at these very different scales, and what I'm stressing here is the idea of the neuron as a kind of infrastructural ideology that allows us to scale from inside human minds all the way up to markets. Um, allows, and basically the only thing that can coordinate individuals do not make fully informed decisions, but the market can coordinate these subjective actions into uh, a self-organizing patterned system. Uh, that is essentially one of communication. So, and more critically, uh, most critically, increasingly, the ideal of a democratic or free order takes on the formation here of a networked intelligence uh, operating purposefully, but not necessarily consciously through a model of a communication system for which price is but one type. Such ideals of organization underpinned a growing conception of systems as self-evolving and emergent, capable of novelty and innovation and adaptation without any forms of deliberative or representational decision-making. So I want to accentuate, um, uh, so basically, as scholars have noted, however, Hayek faced increasing challenges to his theories as the democratic collapse new liberals had imagined happening in the UK and the US after war never occurred. So to continue supporting his ideology of free markets as the only route to freedom, Hayek increasingly turned to theories of systems and emergence in biology and cybernetics, as you can see. So when viewed within the context, I wanna just reiterate these kind of three features of Hayek's thinking that are key to our discussion today. First, markets are about coordinating information, not matching supply and demand any longer. So they're kind of unrelated to that GDP. Network decision-making, a uh, model of learning and using knowledge is grounded in the idea of a networked intelligence that's embodied by the market as, as one type of networked intelligence, but we could understand it uh, on other systems as well. And secondly, it's like an environmental reconceptualization of intelligence. There's a knowledge that's being produced outside of individual humans, a notion of cognition and decision-making that's dispersed in the world and possessed by entities outside of the human. And we might also ask that in this process, what we might label the social kind of drops out discursively. And again, this is, I'm not saying the social disappears for real. I'm just saying that discursively we see it's kind of drop out. So if, the market, the infamous neo, this brings us to machines. The market, the infamous neoliberal Milton Friedman famously stated is an engine, not a camera. But if it is an engine, what form of machine would it be? In 1956, a series of computer scientists, psychologists and related scientists embarked on a new version of cybernetics. In a proposal for a workshop at Dartmouth College in 1955, they labeled it artificial intelligence. And this was actually in an effort to separate from older forms of cybernetics and Norbert Wiener in particular. One form, uh, one model that was being presented at these conferences aspired, however, not to be about representation or symbolic or linguistic rules, but rather like the market itself, a machine. The model was the process of learning, Frank Rosenblatt's perceptron. Um, Crucially, Rosenblatt's model depended upon a net of neuron-like entities among which associations would be established whenever a sensory organ was triggered by an external stimuli. Whereas earlier models of the neural net and cybernetic intelligence insisted upon this idea of singular and isolated individuals, this model fundamentally rested upon the assumption that intelligence must emerge from the actions of multiple agents and not merely isolated machines. And when he said, um, and he quite clearly mentioned in his own uh, introduction to the development of these first neural nets, a small number had Hayek. So these are the inspirations for this model of machine that now has gone on to become um, the, the formative model for neural nets. And one of the reasons it didn't work originally um, is simply that with this data sets weren't big enough, but now they are. And it is precisely because perceptrons require training data as well as um, training data 
they can in principle be trained on population level experience, right? As you know, networks do not uh, operate by just working alone, they have to be in a net. And just as an example, this is a acute formulation of it takes for those who may or may not know, uh, this was the first operating neural net uh, pandemonium developed by Oliver Selfridge shortly afterwards in 1959. And it was a character recognition program that actually worked. Uh, and this is kind of an example of, of a perceptron where essentially you have each logic gate is, is like a neuron. It fires on or off, making yes, no, true, false statements. And each one goes, so you have a first little set of nets that goes out and looks, let's say, for straight lines. That's called the image de demon. It finds an A. Um, the next group uh, is supposed to scream if some of them say, ah, when they see a straight line. Some of them say, no, when they because they're looking for curves and slowly it goes up the chain. It was called pandemonium because you'll hear with an A, obviously the straight line demons will be screaming really loud. And then finally there's a decision demon who figures out statistically according to how many yes, no's, according to what shape, uh, which letter it is. And then uh, this is supervised learning. It goes back, they see they check it with the input and if it and if the weights have to be corrected right there weren't enough net screaming at straight lines then you kind of weigh the net uh in accordance to so that until it finally figures out and reads the right letter but as you can see this is not something done alone it's a kind of networked form of decision making where a lot of little stupid things end up kind of doing things and the most important thing is you don't have to explain to the computer what an A is. And so they're trying to evade essentially, although they never can, representation. Because it's, you know, you don't have to represent an A to a machine. You can just go ahead and learn without it. So intelligence here is reformulated as networked and capable of evolution through population level coordination of data and it's stochiastic. So there's a probabilities, right? You're constantly weighing the percentages. And I emphasize these notion of self-organized evolution and kind of learning and probability in the thought of both economists and technologists. Because for both such notions of learning, coordinated ideas that systems might change and adapt non-consciously. The central feature of these models concerned evading the need to represent the solution of a problem or the future. The model posits that small operations done in small parts of a problem might agglomerate as a group into more than their parts and solve problems whose solutions do not require representation to the machine ahead of time. Systems at different scales are probabilistically related to their parts. Calculating each individual uh, uh, component will not predict the whole system, right? Everything's subjective. So it's really a discourse that's really against prediction and planning above all. Or, or shall we say, um, planning with uh, consciousness. The hope being that these small operations might culminate in producing more sophisticated thoughts while evading the problem of actually having to describe or represent the solution. While not truly possible, this contradictory need to evade representation continues to fuel our, our desire for unsupervised learning in networks and the agglomeration of ever larger data sets. So like better data will replace the need to like consciously represent things. The data would, in theory, drive uh, the thought. Furthermore, when situated in relationship to Hake's ideal of the economy as the most and perhaps only route to human freedom, we can trace the rise of a broader ideology that identified the flow of information and its coordination as the necessary infrastructure for human freedom, liberty, and equality, all terms that um, neoliberals used interchangeably. Since for Hayek, freedom from coercion was the only freedom that could be called liberty and coercion equated with, and I quote, all attempts to impose upon a society a deliberately chosen pattern of distribution, we can deduce that any forced effort to produce particular populations or data distribution, at, or data distributions, i.e., for example, um, forcing integration or reallocating wealth to different populations by plan, would also equate with a challenge to human liberty and freedom. So we can't evade the kind of popularity and rise of these within the context of a post-civil rights United States. Um, so while Hay can be interpreted to be allowing for the possibility that redistributing wealth or healthcare 
might be necessary condition to enable individuals to exercise non-coerced choices in the market, what might be labeled freedom, neoliberal discourse focused instead on asserting the seeming natural, since it's neurons, uh, and never calculatable nature of market processes, thus rendering any form of pre-planning or redistribution of resources or services as endangering the very possibility of evolution, and by derivation, terminating the possibility of any future other than the present. This tension would come to play out critically in fantasies of envisioning feedback and increasing the flow of data um, to seeming solutions to these impasses of political orders. And exactly in my other work, we see uh, the rise of kind of these technological and machine driven fantasies of smart cities to deal with racial warfare in the United States, all of which kind of hope that data driven decision making will resolve the supposed political impasse that democracy can't. But the very features that made such uh, systems evolutionary and emergent were also their terminal failing point. The stochiastic property of nets led to unpredictability and potential increases in entropy. And such concerns were long running in the cybernetic um, sciences. On a less metaphysical level, as we already saw from Hebb, both neural net network researchers and theoreticians found two problems. One concerned excess data and the second um, adaptability or plasticity. If human brains could be trained, for example, as they were in the Hebb's experience, how do human beings maintain their stability in the face of environmental stresses? And supposedly in these studies, they all went crazy. Um, if you mean, uh, how did nets know if they're being trained on errors? So what happens when you're propagating the wrong information and it's getting exacerbated through these learning systems or manipulated? In short, how do you know if a signal is coming from within or without the net and from where? And if a system is always adapting, how does it not mutate to the point of extinction or psychosis, which was the concern for many in the Cold War um, facing nuclear Armageddon? Neural network researchers quickly discovered that errors in waiting might propagate and exacerbate errors, as I mentioned. Um, and neural network only refracted a larger discourse repeated by cyberneticians, political scientists, social scientists, and economists that if network feedback loops fed the wrong positive feedback, for example, in nuclear confrontations, it might lead to network instability and even terminal failure. And in the post war period, Economists also obsessed about how to avoid the sort of market failure, shocks if we will, that had led to the rise of totalitarian regimes in Europe after First World War. Within the context of the Cold War, such historical memories of market failure came and joined with new concerns about the future survival of, social, of, um, of democratic and capitalist societies, or what were called. The question, however, was about decision making were population sound decision makers. A history of popula populist democratic fascism or rabid anti-communism, such as suggested here by Joseph McCarthy, suggested otherwise. Richard Hofstetter's path-breaking analysis of Senator McCarthy's anti-communism stands out in this regard. This paranoid style, he argued at the time, understands the world in terms of patterns of behavior among different targeted groups overstating the possibility of prediction and control over the future. In short, too much data might also provide ecological fallacy and false patterns that in turn are reactionarily um, responded to by creating fake fan nostalgic fantasies for control over those patterns. So put simply, when you see a pattern, how do you know if it's not the deep state or the market simply making its free choices. And this is kind of a fundamental problem inside of neoliberal, that it, there seems to be a uh, inerry uh, paranoia in the language actually of the people speaking in the 50s and 60s who are actually talking about paranoia, illusion, delusions and schizophrenia. So it's not my language theorizing it, it's actually how people are talking about it at the time. However, such paranoias provoke problems for the concept of the invisible hand, as I mentioned. Economists like technocrats had to provide new concepts of decision making that might, evo that might evade the determinism of conspiracy, but still legitimate the purported democracy of the market. While Hayek never discussed conspiracy and rarely paranoia, the economist, um, his entire theoretical project is against conceiving complex orders as though they were is against any sort of idea that complex orders were designed or planned. Uh, and thus any hint of planning is also understood as a conspiracy against freedom. So he's like, again, 
deep state or market is somebody planning, you know, there's a constant paranoia against planning. Hicks' obsession was thus modeling the world as one of self-organized um, adaptive systems to counter the idea of a planned and perfectly controllable political and in his mind totalitarian order. So this created a new problem of kind of how do we know what the truth is, right? Um, is it a fake signal uh, created by, again, a planned and conscious entity, or is it just the market signaling its perfect operations? How do you know? So the new concept of an intelligence that is autopoietic, self-organizing, and cybernetic found itself caught between the problem of what would happen if all the messages being circulated were false or noise, and the two are now not clearly separated. But what would truth be? What we find really surprising, however, is that by the 80s, nobody even cares about what's true or false. So in fact, um, in 1986, Fisher Black, the, the, the inventor of the derivatives pricing equations that are now 700 times the size of the global GDP, makes this a remarkable statement. The effect of noise on the world and our views of the world are profound. Noise makes trading in financial markets possible and thus allows us to observe prices for financial assets. Amazing, so noise is actually the site of arbitrage. It is the site of value. So now falsity has been empowered as kind of um, a valuable thing, as a possible engine for producing markets. In his famous article, Noise Trading Formalized the New Discourse in Finance and Positive that we trade on profit and, and profit from misinformation and information overload. By the 1980s, these ideas of network stochiastic and population-based intelligence had transformed literally into technologies. And this is the Black Skulls equivalent, uh, um, the Black Skulls uh, derivative trading equation that um, fueled the subprime mortgage uh, collapse and actually the recent British collapse of the pound. Um, so we actually see the technicization of these concepts into technology uh, that's actually kind of running our automated financial trading. But in this new embrace of automated financial trading, what no longer existed was the problem of equilibrium or concern for entropic disorganization. If 19th and earliest 20th century economists, even Hayek, still worried about the maintenance of the market itself and the stability of value, or about entropy and the tendency of systems, whether political or economic to degrade, now the concern has been deferred um, and even capitalized upon. So, you know, falsity has now become a value. Ironically, however, the very pa problems of false patterns, delusions, and noise that threaten the stability of such self-organizing systems were the grounds for an increased demand to introduce more, more uh, computation into the environment rather than safeguard networks by perhaps fostering different types of systems, the state separated from the economy or psychology separated from computation. These crises, in fact, drove for the increased assimilation of more territory into calculation. More data, maybe even more noise, was the answer. The less that enters consciousness, the more operations that can be made without thought, the better. And in fact, um, Hayek often liked to quote um, Alfred North Whitehead by saying, civilization advances. So this is Hayek liking to quote um, Whitehead by saying, civilization advances by extending the number of important operations we can perform without thinking about them. So the less thought, the better. Wonderful. So, um, so this is our new questions of freedom that we are posed. So more data, maybe more noise is the answer. The less the answer is consciousness, the more operations that can be made without thought, the better. Thus the emergence of computationally driven markets through technologies like derivative pricing equations, um, me, uh, uh, and more terrifyingly, perhaps the increased understanding that to manage system means offering more freedom to execute individual market decisions, a freedom now incorporated into our network systems, our environments, and our individual market choices, um, and perhaps ultimately into our alt-right politics that wager wars on the grounds of misinformation as currency. This all has great implications for our presence. So I'm gonna just end on these uh, final thoughts. This returns us to the present. I opened this essay arguing that cybernetic
politics, it's an affiliated communication and human sciences aspired to the elimination of political and psychological trauma through the dream of the self-organizing systems and autopoietic intelligences produced from the minute actions of small stupid logic gates. A dream of a world of networks without limit focused eternally on an indefinite and extendable never defined future that might be consumed in the present. This dream may now be partially realized and we have to generate a new set of fantasies. To do so does not mean wishing like reactionary politicians, however, to return to a mythic past. It also does not denote fantasizing a Cartesian ethics with transparent algorithms and black boxes and no black boxes. To do so would only be to replicate the reactionary logic of the database where processes of distinction and inevitably discrimination are stored only to be retrieved without consciousness or history. Nor does it mean evading the power we bequeath from our machines. As cultural theorist Randy Martin has argued, rather than separating itself from social processes of production and reproduction, algorithmic finance actually demonstrates the increased interrelatedness, globalization and socialization of debt and precarity. By tying together disparate actions and objects into a single assembled uh, bundle of reallocated risks to trade, the new market machines make us more indebted both to each other. The political and ethical question has, has become how might we activate this new indebtedness in new ways that are less amenable to the strict market logics of neoliberal economics. And so, for example, in the subprime mortgage uh, collapse of 2008 uh, increasingly tied middle class and lower classes and did result in a movement perhaps unsuccessful of Occupy, but nonetheless demonstrated how um, these systems are both capable of generating new politics as well as suddenly making the social visible in their failure. Hayek himself suggested such a possibility in his own thought. Markets, he argued, demand difference. From the fact that people are very different, it follows that we treat them equally. The result must be inequality in their actual position, and that the only way to place them in an equal position would be to treat them differently. Equality before the law and material equality are therefore not only different, but are in conflict with each other, and we can achieve either one or the other, but not both at the same time. With these words, he stated the fundamental dilemma of neoliberalism. To be free, we have to be put in relation to each other. But he also wavers. Does liberty denote equal treatment and therefore generic law or dif differential and situated treatment, which might denote planning or coercion or affirmative action, for example? The response of neoliberal discourse has been to automate the relationship between these two entities, thus obscuring its social character to exactly extract value out of difference as derivative pricing equations do. They, um, to extract value from differences between humans while maintaining that such relations emerge evolutionarily and thus non-intentional but natural and necessary. And the neural net is kind of this great engine of kind of naturalization around um, essentially socio-technical constructs. But might this discourse be disrupted? Recalling the argument that difference is the foundation for freedom or liberty, can we push the neoliberal imaginary into folds? This tension might be the source of a possible freedom through relations if they're historically situated the exact thing that neoliberalism denies. The fantasy of an archive of processes of differentiation might be mobilized to new ends, mainly to recognize the permeable, political, and situated nature of social orders. The future, I argue, lies in recognizing what our machines have finally made visible, what has perhaps always been there, mainly the socio-political nature of our natural thoughts and perceptions, and that all computer systems are programmed and therefore planned. We are also forced to contend with the intentional and therefore changeable nature of how we both think and perceive our world. And I end with kind of some thoughts about that uh, in terms of Theaster Gates's Dorchester projects, how, uh, product that came actually in the wake of the subprime um, mortgage crisis in the United States and sort of as an effort at creating these community spaces uh, and archives is also a artistic project. Of course, we think about contemporary um, social movements that are uh, organized through the same social networks, of course, and mediated technologies that kind of uh, attempt to reassert issues of history um, into uh, the system, if we will. Uh, and I leave it to us to discuss other further possibilities.
Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. I think Thank you. I, I'll actually got messages from some audience. I I think I'll just watch a PhD. <laughs> Oh, no, <laughs> no, I know information inundation is a virtue uh, in the digital world or a sin. Um, but yeah, it, it tends to I have a, a lot of stuff going on, um, but it, it's more about finding uh, new links between these histories and um, and uh, and I apologize a little bit. This was a, a bit of a, a difficult interface for me because I was like uh, with figuring out the team. So there's sort of some stilting stuff there, but uh, please ask as many questions as you want. <laughs> I think we are all just very impressed. And I think we have a lot of questions coming in. I think I saw Bijong raise your hand and Khan too, am I correct? Yes, I actually wasn't intending to, but I did. And I actually do have questions. And, and uh, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, extremely rich and, and uh, thought provoking talk. And I really, enjoyed it in so many different ways and I, I have so many questions but I'll just uh, you know throw one question at you which is just a matter of um, I guess um, curiosity uh, do you know if uh, if Hayek had any uh, idea about uh, what was going on in uh, in physics uh, during uh, the, the decades when he was writing these books uh, and uh, I mean, especially in quantum physics, I, I saw the the notion of Brownian motion there on one of your slides. Uh, so yeah, I'm just wondering about this. Oh yeah, I'm not sure what you guys were seeing, and I, I skipped some slides because, uh, I, like I said, I was kind of having interface issues. But uh, Hake um, was really into systems theory and was dealing with a lot of biologists. Um, but the person who was Fisher Black, who came up with that uh, equation, actually uh, put a, Nor and Norbert Wiener was into Brownian motion. Uh, so all these people were reading cyberneticians, but Fisher Black deliberately put together basically Brownian motion, like that equation is essentially like entropy with a normal curve. Uh, it's to allow you to kind of um, negotiate or make bets on uh, unpredictable futures. And there's a whole series of other um, sort of new techniques that emerge, whether it's Monte Carlo simulation, or other things that are all about, if you will, um, probability without like a linear predic prediction that is quite deliberately. So Fisher Black was at MIT and he actually did his thing in AI. He's not an economist or finance, but then joined up with Myron Skull with a bunch of economists and came up with those equations, but they're heavily informed by, um, and in fact have elements of the equation, our Brownian have actually incorporated that history of thermodynamics and, um, and physics into, uh, into finance. Um, which is a super interesting uh, question. Absolutely, yes, thank you. And Khan? Yeah, thank you so much. That was really impressive. Um, I was not aware of this um, relation. Um, what I was asking myself when uh, you unfolded this really interesting relation between neuroscience and uh, finance um, and the idea of the neural network and so on and so forth um, and the auto poises behind it uh, in Hayek's thoughts. Um, I was asking myself how you would relate this to the idea of the invisible hand because be, behind the invisible hand, there's also no subject, uh, no one who makes the decision, at least. Um, so do, do you think this is rooted in, in Adam Smith's concept of the invisible hand? You know, that's something I'm trying to figure out, but it's a, it's a broader question, actually, also of um, religion and um, both contemporary politics and economics. So uh, there's no question that there's an ongoing idea about the invisible hand. Um, 
Hick himself doesn't so much engage with that history um, because he's mostly interested in Keynesianism and I guess what we could call the visible hand, like when management, uh, there's actually a great book called The Visible Hand uh, about the rise of um, manager of managerial culture in the railroads in the 19th century and sort of the idea that like things do have to be directed uh but adam smith of course still had this idea of moral orders and theology operating around kind of uh the invisible the market kind of had a relationship and i'm not an expert on adam smith by the way so please if someone here is like please correct me but i my co-author is and uh and one of um, what he's argued is that that sort of has a, has a, you know, it's kind of God divinity as the indivisible hand in the case of Adam Smith and that there's still um, individuals are capable of, of, of moral orders and the market has a kind of moral valence, like the markets are supposed to make the morally better decision, uh, not just the optimization of, um, value or, or you know uh the best price um decision so there are definitely histories there that in here and that's one of the big questions too is how does uh this history link back to other histories so for example one thing i've been looking at is the relationship between Malthusianism and kind of race and sex because of the idea that populations have to be, you know, are only as valuable as their labor or that we either need more or less. That we hear a lot of this coming up right now. And then sort of financial and economic technologies that are actually not anymore about you just human populations. It can be a population of any type of data, and also don't necessarily um, relate to those same histories of the nation state and, um, and the wealth of nations as, as kind of a racial and sexual reproduction question. So how did the two graft each other on top of each other? I think that's one of our big questions. How do older histories of divinity, race, nation state graft onto these other histories that are coming out of, uh, yes, out of wars, but also out of computation and logic and physics. So they're, they're kind of getting hybridized and so the political question is sort of what do we do with those new assemblages and what new tactics does it afford but also what new critiques are necessary i don't know if that answers anything yeah thank you yes um so we have roughly 20 minutes left and sorry i forgot to explain to everyone you can use the we click the reaction button and you can now can see you raise your hands now i will sit you where you can talk to Orit, but maybe in the meantime, I also have some questions because as you know that I have always followed Orit's work. So now I would, I would like to just zoom out a little bit from the lecture. I, I'm just very curious about um, Orit as a historian, what motivate you to do the kind of work you're doing? Because obviously it's very committed, very labor intensive. I'm just very curious what motivated you. Well, to be honest, um, I, I don't have things, but uh well i'm sure everyone might or maybe you didn't you weren't following the kind of hysterias going on with the market over covid and that was kind of a amazing i mean i've long been concerned with neoliberalism and obviously new forms of governmentality but uh i was really interested in just the kind of interactive feature uh the democratization of the market the fact that um brown and black and female bodies were dying at exponential rates from this thing while people were making endless amounts of money. And it, and, and then of course, what was the really, what was the relationship of that both in a mediated way and also how do we think about um, the contemporary uh, reactionary right? So it's really thinking about how neoliberalism is or is not always abetting um, reactionary right-wing movements. And right now, particularly after the Dobbs decision on reproductive rights and in the United States, there becomes a increasing question, like on one hand, there seems to be a cyborg potential inside our technology. 
But why doesn't it get actually like what's happening in this neoliberal discourse that is always kind of folding back into reactionary par paranoid politics, but also actually reshoring up uh, concepts of, of the nation state, race and sex that um, really you're, you're kind of, it's not, they don't have to be there, but like, is it, how do we make it not inevitable? you know, that uh, digital technologies lead to extremist politics and extreme um, market differentials. I mean, I could also, I, I kind of skipped over some images that also drive me, uh, which are things like, oh, sorry, I think I just uh, somehow gave up my screen. But, um, uh, you know, I've been looking at wealth disparity, you know, obviously they've increased, it's increased exponentially with these financial technologies. So there's a whole series of pressing real world issues that also force us, but also, you know, you don't want to assume the world had to be this way, you know, uh, and that it can't change. So there's a way you want to ask about determinism and digital technologies and, assemblages and sort of there seems to be features of this history that could have gone elsewhere like neuroplasticity seems like an interesting thing the fact that humans aren't you know aren't biodetermined uh seems like a potential inside a network that could be activated um the idea that economies aren't only grounded in um you know in in like populations as as kind of values to the nation this could be interesting to work with but uh it seems that at the same time the particular histories that this came in and the particular assemblages aren't operating in ways that kind of liberate that possibility so a lot of it is about trying to disentangle what seems obvious like you know at the end of the day i think we make a lot of automatic assumptions that social networks increase um, political extremism and, and, you know, like that, that's just an inevitable thing, uh, you know, and I, and I assume that that's also what most of you do, which is what activates us to think about what kind of critical practices, what kind of practice, aesthetic practices um, do unexpected things like, you know, what does it mean to reimagine a collective? That's why I kind of, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't really talk about uh, document a lot, but you know, there is a question here about like, what, what, what does it mean to reactivate collectivity such that history or political or a care for um, difference reintroduces itself in the face of uh, systems that actually value collectivity, of course. I mean, whether it's shared labor or, or you know, the digital workspace where we're all part of a group now and we're on teams right now, in fact, teaming up. <laughs> you know, so this is kind of a default thing. So yeah. you you want to ask like, what difference does difference make in a collective? What you know, what aesthetic practices break the sort of um, hegemony of a particular, uh, of, a, of a system, of, of a kind of ideology that's hooked picked our brains literally into our markets. Um, these are these are the kind of questions that animate uh, my research. Thank you. Um, I, oh, I see John have a question. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, in the light of what you just said, um, I'm, I was thinking, what do you, um, what, what's your view of somebody like Cathy O'Neill, who believes that if, if you democratize the algorithms and you and you're in a position to democratize the techno system. Um, I, I have a, I have, let me say this, all things are situated practices. So what it means to democratize, like Robin Hood democratizes investing, but that doesn't democratize capital. So, um, it's a really highly contextualized question. I, on one hand, I, I have to say I'm very, very skeptical of a kind of Cartesian fantasy that at some point you're going to take the black box off and somehow just be able to see the system. And it's a, and that there's just some way to liberate, you know, every algorithm and, and once we know everything. But on the other hand, I, there's no question in my mind that that the more different people have uh, access and 
engagement with the technology, you know, the more possible opportunities there might be. But it's always a structural question, which is to say, for example, you know, programming is getting cheaper and cheaper because everyone's learning to program. But that is making programmers less and less powerful in their institutions. So it you have to be able to democratize the technology, but structurally change, you know, it, it because most of the democratization is happening around cheapening labor, you know, but I, does that make sense? So I don't think there's like one answer, but I think that there's no question. And even in my own work, I do a lot of work in my classes to just teach people like to even know about financial algorithm, you know, instead of saying like, oh, the derivative trading equation is so hard. Like you read in the newspaper, oh, there's these complex equations. Well, actually they're not complex at all. Uh, what's complex is getting the money because none of us have billions of dollars. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think there's something to be said always for like education and, and, um, so what what do you what do you think what, you, what do you think about citizen science in relation to this? Again, it's all structural. I think there's there's not, there's not like one good or bad citizen science. There's like I think citizen science is wonderful. I think uh, people do great work uh, monitoring the environments in their neighborhoods. There's there's wonderful activism. Uh, for example, I have friends who work on indigenous communities and. Um, uh, in Chemical Valley in Toronto or in the Toronto area in Ontario and you know it's really important about kind of creating uh, uh, knowledge and kind of information systems for activism but you know I, I also you know know that um, there's also a question about like abandoning uh, any kind of big science or federal funding for you know people to do research at, at different levels of expertise um so i don't i don't i i really think difference is the answer if that makes any sense well like, yeah i mean there has to be a diversity of responses and i wouldn't come in saying like citizen science should replace all big science or regular science um that there can be complementary um um useful things but that it's also you know um, i don't want everyone just to be taught programming and algorithms they should learn other things too you know so like it's about diversity yeah i, I yeah i agree I, because i mean the big the big decisions are still made outside of the purview of of users and um you know amateur programmers there's also a question about yeah i mean there's there's good there's excellent questions just about power. And I think that's why uh, I insist on a, in my other work on a, on a kind of embrace of the question of civil rights, because, uh, and this is also an interesting question um, for art, because, you know, there is a question about aestheticization of politics, like should art exhibits be doing stuff or should we be giving it to lawyer or maybe that's not I think those are the wrong questions frankly again in the interest of diversity uh but I think that there is a question ultimately about enfranchisement and um one of the big concerns about the neoliberal story has been the the, the vacating of the concept of freedom away from political enfranchisement which is to say to be able to exercise power uh, and that's basically, if I understand your question, so I'm a... Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think we have roughly 10 minutes left, but I want to continue the uh, last question I have for, oh, I think we already can't touch upon that, because I know a lot of our audience are actually from a Art background, or curators, or artists, or art theorists. I'll, I'm just curious what you, um, what you think as a historian, how you can see in the coming future how artists can have a actionable agenda, or how they can take part in this discourse of this um, ultra techno infrastructure and the, the becoming of the nuance. I mean, there are so many 
places that art has a place, but one of my biggest interests um, and the place where I, I see my affiliation with the humanities, literature, the arts is, is you know, uh, I didn't talk a lot about it, but so much of this is about um, speculating and containing futures. I mean, um, and there's such a critical job about trying to imagine um, futures that are not necessarily subscribing either to these economic orders or these reactionary political orders. So not just responding to them, but actually envisioning other ways of being. Um, and I see that in ton tons of art projects, of course. Um, so I, I showed a, a few little ones that, I mean, not little actually, um, but you know, even the Theaster Gates, the effort to kind of take up reconstruction, uh, both the whole history of slavery and also um, reconstructing these neighborhoods in the wake of these subprime, these uh, devastating financial events actually for black homeowners. Um, I think it's, it's really powerful to be like, there are different ways to be together. There's different ways to construct and maybe there's different forms of ownership uh, and land property rights that we can have. Um, obviously there's so much environmental and uh, political action going on that is about trying to envision um, uh, other ways of living in the world and being together that aren't necessarily unmediated. They're not techno, I also really think it's great that so much stuff isn't technophobic. That it is about uh, investigating glitches or just looking at the emergent properties of networks when they don't do what we want them to do. Um, I think those things are, are critical places to envision the world as, as not already known and not necessarily apocalyptic. I mean, there's, uh, there's so many negative valences to the contemporary politics, but you know, really at the end of the day, something like a derivatives equation, it's, it's buying and selling the future. And considering it's 700 times the size of the GDP, like there's a lot of future buy, being bought and sold right now. So um, in a world where, you know, even carbon markets are heavily leveraged forward uh, and people are betting those and I get Britain is right now undergoing um, uh, a leverage. <laughs> I mean, actually uh, the whole thing uh, collapsed apparently because of these derivative equations in the side, inside the pension funds. Um, uh, you know, you're dealing with a question where people are really banking in and out of, of, of the future and there's a necessity of creating other ways to, to imagine and manage and, and, be, and be together um, and to think about futurity. So I don't know if that was the answer, but um, that's really where I think art, art doesn't, I think there's a lot of important documentary art too, but I'm mostly interested in the speculative and fictive personally, but that's a personal. No, this is fantastic. Um, so I, I, I know Kahan has to run off very soon, but I would just like to wrap up. If no more questions coming in from the audience, you, this is your last chance, then I'm going to wrap up with one cheeky questions. And then, we're quite like so my last question will be there's so many crises that emergency everywhere of it where shall we start <laughs> i mean yeah locally i mean i guess that's like the the good thing about like often when you think about the planetary it's it's a term that at least uh, that I often define as the syncopation of differences in time. So there are certain shared conditions, the climate crisis, the te technological platforms, things like this, but there's also extreme differences um, in the different places. And I think it's about, um, you know, working locally, it, you know, th there's not one, you know, I wouldn't say like you have to address this topic versus this one, um, but I do think obviously there's some shared issues right now of which um, things like the alt-right and the climate crisis uh, rise up for me, but again, that's like a subjective.
thing. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe reduce information because as we learned, there is too much information. <laughs> yes, that's right. It was the right last word. Well, I think there's a lot to be said for situated practices. I think that situatedness is kind of quite, quite important. Um, so. No, it is fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, I think I'll end it here and then we can all take up. You know, again, my mind's blown and I'll take all the oh. inspiration you gave me like always. <laughs> well, thank <laughs> you. And also, please, anyone feel free to be in touch with me. Um, uh, since we're not in person, we have the wonderful, the other, the, the, the great potentials of our network situation. Uh, so please uh, do feel free to be in touch. And Wei Wei, thank you again and everyone uh, for the very warm welcome and for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for your thank time. You. Bye. So good evening. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.